Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Henk van Asswegen. I'm the chairman of the Fred Roche Foundation. And it's my privilege to welcome you to tonight's talk. Um, thank you for taking the time out tonight. I know it's a long weekend and uh, the last week, uh, evening of the week. Um, we have a very interesting uh, talk tonight, which is going to be mobility and infrastructure. And we've got David Locke. Uh, over there, well known uh, to everybody in Holton Keynes, and I don't think I have to say much more about him. He will be chairing the meeting on behalf of Press Roach Foundation, and he will be um, introducing the speakers as well as managing the questions and answer session. Uh, what we would like to do is just quickly give you a brief um, of what the Fred Roach Foundation stands for and what the series of talks are about. Fred Roche Foundation is basically there to commemorate Fred Roche, who's the general manager at uh, the Development Corporation, and what he stood for, the development of Milton Keynes, and following the principles of the new city and the development of the new city accordingly. Our main aim is to actually inform um, and educate and give people an opportunity to learn about Milton Keynes and things that impact on Milton Keynes. It's urban planning, urban development, and how that will impact on the future. This series of talks that we're doing, uh, of which one is tonight, um, all leads up to a much larger event called the 50-50 visioning exercise. And this is looking back 50 years into the past and 50 years into the future, and will hopefully come up with a 10-point plan of what should be done in the future in Milton Keynes. And that's why we're covering all these different topics. Our next talk uh, will be on the 22nd of May, so if you want to put that in your diaries, um, same venue, same time or less, and uh, it will be called Finding the Local Economy. And our main speaker for the evening will be Andrew Carter, who's the Deputy Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities. And uh, we're fortunate enough uh, in that instance again to have David Locke chairing uh, for us that evening. So uh, please feel welcome. Um, as you all might have picked up, there are wine and drinks on the other side. Um, I'm going to allow David to introduce the speakers and enjoy yourselves and please, if you afterwards, uh, when there are questions and answers, could you identify yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. And let's get moving along. Uh, my name is David Locke. I'm a resident of Milton Keynes and the town planner. Uh, I worked with Fred Roach for about 10 years um, and before he fell ill and we lost him. And um, I've explained to our guest speakers tonight, Professor John Miles and David Marin, um, one of whom is relatively local and the other is from Essex, um, that uh, our audiences for occasions like this in Milton Keynes are rather unusual in that, um, probably because it was the last of the New Towns programme, there's a rather high density of professional people kind of washed up in this new town than happened in most of the others. Uh, as you can imagine, as each new town was developed, the teams often moved on to the next one. Fred himself came here from Runcorn, and others came from Irving Newtown in, in Scotland uh, that I know about. One comes from Cumbernauld, but he doesn't tell anybody, because <laughs> uh, it's awful. Um, so we have a professional audience uh, at different degrees of uh, full-time or part-time or retired engagement, but all interested. And um, this means that our, um, I've explained, that our interest level is wide and expansive and global. We are interested in things that are happening throughout the world. But of course we also have, uh, as you'd expect, uh, a local interest in the subject matter as well. So we. Um, descend from the general to the particular as an audience and we're not twits that they have been told. Um, the second thing I, I would like to say to set the scene, this is a Fred Roach uh, Foundation occasion um, and, and thanks to the gallery for enabling it to happen here, is that um, uh, two things really about Milton Keynes if you'll allow me by way of setting a scene. Um, one is that um, you know that it is one of the most common uh, slanders that Milton Keynes was designed only for the motor car. If I had, you know, 10p for every time I heard somebody say that, uh, I would be better off than I am now. Um, if you do read the plan for Milton Keynes, you know that that is actually a lie. And if you were in any way involved in building Milton Keynes or developing it, you will know how, mu how much effort went in 
to try and develop the other modes. When um, I was working at the corporation, so I went on for long, um, the issue about mobility in the city had reached quite a crisis stage. The bus companies, the old-fashioned bus companies that were here before Milton Keynes were developed, were very sleepy and were still insisting on running buses along their old routes, you know, from Bletchley to Newport Pagnell, as though a city for by then 100,000 people had not been built in between. And there was a lot of work I had to go in to explain, if I remember, was it United County? I think it was United County. To persuade them to accept the fact that the city was actually growing beneath their wheels and that they should read timetable and read structure, reconfigure their business. But aside from that, Mrs. Thatcher privatised the bus companies just as Milton Keynes reached a size in which transportation became really critical. And I have to say, for those that have not been involved in, uh, luckily had the chance to be involved in building cities, if you have no leverage over public transport systems, it is very difficult to develop public transport systems. It is jolly difficult. You have to bribe bus companies to do what you want to do, or cajole, or bully, or harass, or excite. But it's very hard work. And to illustrate my point, as I recall it, Within 18 months, certainly two years of privatisation, the privatised bus companies had sold the bus depot at Stony Stratford for a profit, refused to use the brand new bus station we built for them down by the train station, because they said it was a bit inconvenient to get to, and had begun the plans, which took a few more years to come to fruition, to sell the bus depot we had built for them in, um, is it Winter Hill? I think it was in Winter Hill. So um, I want you to understand that the implementation of public transport in this city has been extremely difficult. And I want you, as you listen to tonight's presentations, please, could I encourage you to distinguish in your minds between the need to design towns and cities in a way which has paths or corridors of connectivity for whatever form or mode or technology each generation might have. But to keep the route open, a framework, in other words, for movement not always presently defined, as distinct from designing a town around a particular technology uh, which may, in due course, become obsolete. Runcorn, Newtown, figure of eight busway, Arthur Ling's master plan, you may recall, but depended on controlled bus services, much harder to work now, it is only privatised. Um, what's the strange one that Foster's building in a desert? In a, uh, Mazdar. Mazdar, um, which is an amazing ecological city built in a place which has no water in the middle of a desert, um, is designed around um, a, 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 an electronic uh, advanced passenger transit system. Um, but again, from my studies of that master plan, one does worry what will happen should that particular technology change, because it's technology specific rather than pathway specific. There we are, I've already talked for a little longer than I meant to. But mobility in Milton Keynes was a big issue for Fred. He created mobility seminars uh, to try and understand what we could do to help poor people get around in Milton Keynes. And we found it really, really difficult when we had no leverage, leverage over the bus services. So we turn to our first speaker, Professor John Miles, who is Chairman of the Automotive Council's Intelligent yeah. Mobility. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I don't have to read it. You can see it. It's dark here too. John, they've given you. I can't see you, brother. Where are you? Give me that one too. Yes, you did this too. Yeah. You go first. David Barron is going first. <laughs> Actually, you're really doing this deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes, is your slide? <laughs> 20 minutes, thank you very much. Good evening, thanks for inviting me. I'll put my hands up now, I'm going to go to Essex. Although <laughs> I actually work down in Bristol uh, and I was born up north, so I'm not really in Essex. I'd like to talk to you about um, personal rapid transit and the ultra light uh, transportation of that, which is something we've got Okay, I'll use the microphone. Can we turn it towards you, David? Because obviously, where 
Okay, um, Ultra, which is Urban Light Transport, was started in 1995 at the University of Bristol, Bristol by Professor Martin Lowson. Uh, Martin was uh, a very interesting character. He was, um, one of his catchphrases was, it's not rocket science you know, uh, and I do know, because he was a rocket scientist, he was on the Apollo program. But, but, um, uh, he flipped between uh, um, academia and industry, and this was one of his ventures that he thought of in his uh, last time in, at Bristol. So he set himself a target to define an urban transport system for the next century, meeting future needs for flexible personal transport while being highly acceptable in an urban environment. He basically thought, I can't get around Bristol, I must be able to do something better than, than the rest of the So I'd like to, uh, to show you a video of what it is. Unfortunately, you won't be able to, uh, I suppose we've got all of them. No, not on there. Who's in charge of kit here? Mm. Hello, brother. Can Me. Can you move in the um, I'd have to get a cable to get it on. Okay. okay. We're in your hands, David, as to how Right, so I will, uh, I will go through uh, the rest of it and maybe show you the video at the end if we have a cable. That's okay. Uh, so basically, we're all transport experts, or at least I hope we are, because we all uh, move around. So uh, Martin set a, a set of high-level requirements by talking uh, to various people and from his own knowledge. He was a systems engineer, so he starts at the top. So it's basically, when do I want to travel? I want to travel when I want to travel, not to someone else's timetable. Where do I want to go to? I want to go to my final destination. I don't want to go to a bus station or a train station and then have to find my way for the last mile or a couple of miles by a, a different road. Don't want to stop in between to pick people up or drop people off. I want it, my transport to be environmentally friendly, safe and secure, relatively low cost. And I want to integrate with other modes. So if I'm going on a long trip, I want to easily change mode from, from my form of transport to another form of transport. And what he came up with was an automated transport <coughs> system, which is small electric vehicles on a dedicated guideway network with offline stations. And it's essentially um, designed as being the first or last mile of your journey in an urban environment. And sometimes the first and last mile are one and the same. So it's a distributed network around a, a city centre. Uh, <coughs> So, why is it cost efficient and, trans and, and sustainable uh, for cities? In terms of uh, the actual energy use, you can see the graph up there. Uh, the larger bars are the well-to-wheel -well figures, and uh, the lower bar, so the, the dark green, is the actual usage by uh, the ultra vehicle on site. So, even compared with London Underground, it's uh, an economical uh, form of transport in terms of the amount of energy used per passenger mile. It's, uh, as I said earlier, there are no on-site emissions. That's because it's electric. It's very quiet and with minimal vibration, so not the same as a railway or, or uh, even buses. Uh, infrastructure is lighter weight and lower cost than rail. Uh, it's more akin to footbridge infrastructure if you put it above the ground. If you, if you can run it at grade and have got the space, then clearly it's a, a lot less intrusive than that. Due to the lightweight design, the system is highly flexible to install and can be retrofitted into space-constrained urban environments. So everyone's struggling with the same problem, that, that transport systems are, are creaky. You're lucky here, you have a new city that's been relatively recently designed and you still have space. Lots of cities were, uh, have, have grown out of medieval cities and don't have the luxuries that you have here. Cost, always expensive but relatively inexpensive compared with any other form of light rail system. And to put it, that in perspective, the uh, government report that was issued in, uh, I think it was November 2012, Green Light for Light Rail, came up with the average cost for light rail, excluding the expensive bits of tunnels and things, uh, £25.4 million pounds, uh, per mile. Uh, over, that's for all, all of the light rail systems that have been put into, into England in recent times and we're five to 10 million pounds all up. So it also enables multimodal transport use <coughs> and increasing public transport into, into connectivity. So in a place like this, 
place like Lynn and a place like a busy urban environment, uh, where, as I said earlier, we're the first and last mile connectivity that can connect into railway stations, bus stations, can take distribute people around the, the urban centre. But we can also um, connect into park and ride schemes and car clubs uh, and rental car areas. There's an increasing trend, and you'll certainly see it in Berlin, and it's happening in London, where uh, it's, it's too expensive and you don't need a car all the time if you live in those urban environments, but you do need access uh, occasionally. So BMW, as an example, are investing heavily in, in car clubs, and, and there's quite a big take-up, particularly in Berlin at the moment, but London is growing. To put that into context, a couple of independent studies that have been done um, one by Arup and the other one by ITS Leeds. So in Cardiff, um, I, I believe it was Arup, came up with the PRT system, uh, system covering the last two kilometres uh, around the Bay Area would increase patronage by greater than 100% on existing bus and rail services. Not maybe from a fairly low base, but it's still significant. More significant is Gates, Gateshead, where 21 kilometres of PRT uh, serving the inner city will increase the use of rail travel by 168% in the peak and 230% in the off-peak. So that's 168% increase in patronage to public transport because there is a credible alternative to private transport in the peak period. So just to give you a, a view of the system we've got in place at Heathrow, why was it built? It was built to demonstrate the benefits and viability of the PRT system for Heathrow Airport and it connects uh, Terminal 5 to the, to the Terminal 5 business car park. It's got a one-way trip length of 1.7 kilometres, trip time of five minutes, it's almost five minutes, uh, which was 10 to 15 minutes on the bus previously. And there are currently 21 passenger vehicles and three stations. The first phase, which is what we've got uh, of the system, had three pri primary aims. Prove the technology, show the ability to generate revenue, and confirm a positive passenger reaction. And the system, which has been in service uh, three years this May, this May, has exceeded expectations on all of those. To put it in perspective, that 1.7 kilometre route crosses two river, rivers, crosses uh, a road seven times, uh, dips down under the um, glide slope of the runway right at the end of the runway and climbs up into the uh, second floor of the multi-storey car park weaving through the uh, pillars of the ramp for the cars there and it was retrofitted uh, after all of the rest of the, uh, of the infrastructure had been built. There were no underground services that needed to be moved to uh, put it in place and there was no disturbance to the airport or the airport services during its, its construction. So how does it work? Proven reliability and capacity, uh, getting on for a million passengers now. To put it, again, to put it in perspective, the business car park is about 1,280 spaces. So we do roughly 6,000 people per week. Um, <coughs> we've done over uh, 2 million uh, vehicle kilometres, that's autonomous vehicles, uh, in passenger service, which no one else in the world has got uh, for an autonomous car. We've got over 99% service availability. Uh, year to date, we're running at about 99.8%, which is better than any other service tra uh, transport system at the airport, including Heathrow Express, London Underground, uh, and lots of other systems. Average waiting time for a vehicle over the entire population, that's a million passengers, three years of service, is less than 15 seconds. 80% of passengers, greater than 80% of passengers, uh, don't have any weight at all, they turn up and there's a vehicle there ready for them. In terms of revenue generation, car park tariff is 23.4% higher than uh, other business uh, parking. It's been increased since the system went in because of PRT. Car park occupancy has gone up 10% uh, due to PRT. It's only gone up 10% because it's full. It, now, if you turn up on a Tuesday morning, as I, uh, I did last week, at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, you'll get turned away. So they're looking at taking that car back to increase the, the amount of spaces. There's a brand sponsor of the pods. The uh, Marriott Group has sponsored the pods uh, for a significant amount of money for a, a year's sponsorship. So they're wrapped in Marriott col colours now. And uh, the Thistle Hotel, which happened to be next door to the airport, uh, paid to put in a gate and passengers from the, 
this will get charged five pounds each way to use the uh, Heathrow plug system, and that money gets passed through to Heathrow. They've done that because it, it's, uh, it has increased their room occupancy rate and therefore their finances. Non-financial benefits, 70,000 bus journeys uh, a year have been removed just by taking buses from that car park. 200 tonnes of carbon to save per annum for the same reasons. Passenger survey scores, 4.7 out of 5 on the uh, quality service measure score that all airports use. Uh, that is the highest score on the airport. Uh, that's at a terminal that has just been voted for the third time the best terminal in the world. And this is the, the highest score at that terminal. And of course, we score awards. So, isn't it obsolete when the, when the uh, autonomous car comes along? Well, PRT benefits from segregation, and I believe the planners here understood that immensely when they put the, the town plans together that in order for traffic to flow, you do need to segregate different types of traffic. We couldn't give predictable journey times and predictable journeys unless there was seg segregation. Uh, the reason motorways flow better is because they're segregated from the normal uh, roads and there are limited junctions, as an example. Safety. We have a safety case. We have a proven safety case. We're uh, regulated under the Railway and Other Garden Systems regulations. And <coughs> that's something that has to be thought about yet for autonomous cars. It's all very well having uh, clever technology. Uh, I think the Lucas experiments in the 70s, in the 70s uh, had very clever technology and managed to uh, put a driverless car down the motorways. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a safety case. Uh, the safety of cars is reliant on the person behind the wheel. And under the Vienna Convention, it is the driver's responsibility to take over if anything else happens. So that will get worked through, but it's a while yet. And if you talk to people around the world who are in the know, uh, particularly in the States, they're uh, talking 20 years plus uh, for Google cars to be actually allowed to run on the roads properly. The other thing that we have is central control, which allows efficient journey planning. The way the system works is like air traffic control. So you have a slot from the beginning to the end of your journey that's deconflicted from all other traffic, so there's no traffic, other traffic that you've got to run into on the guideway. You know from start to finish that you've got a dedicated slot on that guideway. guideway. And we know where all the vehicles are, and we ensure efficient use of the vehicles, including, where necessary, into vehicle movement to make sure that the vehicles are ready for if there's a bit of a tidal flow in terms of traffic, like early mornings, early in the week, from uh, the business car parks up to Terminal 5. Similarly, in an urban environment, we will know through, through learning and through, through the system requirements that you get when people are wanting to travel from where, and you can ensure that the, the fleet of vehicles is in the right place at the right time. So to achieve the same levels of service and efficiency, autonomous cars will also need uh, to be a commodity, a commodity. So private ownership has to go away before autonomous cars will work as well as PRT. And they will also have to be able to understand the complete traffic picture for the planning journey in order to be able to, be able to deconflict or to give you a, a good flow. Anyone who, who drives around with a um, uh, a sat nav at the moment will know that if you're redirected because there's a traffic problem you'll get redirected along the same routes as everyone else and you'll just have moved that traffic problem and be sitting on a different road in a different set of traffic but still stuck so unless the whole the, there's infrastructure that knows where everything is and how to share that infrastructure between that fleet then uh, I suggest we'll have the same sort of problems but even then, in mixed traffic areas, uh, <coughs> you'll have less predictable journey times uh, and PRT will still be able to provide additional capacity because we can add a layer of capacity if we put it up in the air uh, to these systems. So future systems, we're working with partners uh, around the world at the moment. Uh, people have uh, very crossing, uh, pressing problems, particularly in the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, Taiwan, we've done some work in India, but we're also working in the UK and we've just been talking to a, another um, urban area as well about a, a potential system and doing some modelling work for them. Um, we do our modelling and simulation using the existing system te uh, technology, technology and we've demonstrated that's scalable to meet future system requirements. But uh, some 
uh, numbers behind that. Here's a, a study we did with partners for the city of Florianopolis, which is um, about to progress. The final system here is about 60 kilometers of guideway around the city. So you can see the Brazilians, uh, massive country, but like to live very close together in very high rise uh, buildings. Florianopolis is even worse than other cities in that it's on an island 800 meters off the coast, so it also has a particular problem with getting on, on and off that uh, island. So about 60 kilometres of guideway, about 30 stations, about 70,000 uh, journeys uh, a day on that system. And uh, the downtown area is um, where the, the matrix area is. The big space in the middle is because there's a hill on the island. Uh, and around the back of there, there's a hospital and a university. Uh, it will be about uh, 1,275 vehicles. Uh, and the system will be built in uh, six phases. Uh, and that's one of the things about the system is you can put in a small system and you can grow it. And you can change it as you grow it um, and add to it. And you can also add vehicles if you need additional capacity. You can add guideway if you need to go to a new development. It's an example of, uh, of uh, it's just a still of our simulation which shows how we simulate the vehicles uh, green vehicles here are um, occupied vehicles, red ones are empty vehicles being redistributed. And in the boxes are the numbers of people waiting at each of the stations, which is zero or pretty small numbers in all bar one. If you, if you can see ST4 on there, there's 35 people waiting, and that's because it's a very busy station, it's a parking lot from the mainland. Similar system, New Type A City has got an area that, that it's um, putting in the student games in 2017 called uh, Linkau. And then they're going to develop uh, that area to be, <coughs> as, as we're all aware, they're very short in space, they're going to uh, develop it to be a mixed area, commercial, residential, new area of the city. It has, uh, where, where L1 is there, a link to a metro system, but primarily the, the system is devised to distribute people around that city, uh, around that city area. Uh, again, that's going to be about 16 kilometres uh, and about uh, 3,600 passengers per hour at peak. Again, it uh, will be built in phases. Uh, and people forward looking there, as you can see, they've given us numbers up to 2041 at the moment. So we're just doing the, the study work for that. In fact, we've done the modelling and simulation work for them. And that's all I've got to say. That's what. Uh, First of all, Rapid Transit is. Uh, sorry, I couldn't show you the video because that would be. Does the text. video not work without sound? in your hand? Um, as the brother It will work. Uh, I can run it, but. Uh, is it a long thing? It just a bit of it's, nice it's two and a half minutes. Let me just. Uh, Maybe. Would you mind watching it in silence rather than not watching it at all? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Would you mind? Yeah. It's a mixture of visualisation and real footage. So. Thank you very much. Make pushing noises. <laughs> oh, <that's fun. laughs> Thank you. 
not not bad noise, but it's uh, true. Not um, strange, happy music in the pods. More than you would expect from the skull. <laughs> <laughs> Worst case, we'd have to we'd have to go out and um, uh, take them off, um, but that's that's very rare. Line network work system, you can actually reroute all the other vehicles. Okay, it's not going to be because you two you two have talked to each other. Is it best seriously? Is it best to have ten minutes now, specifically on what you just said? On or do we take you as a pair? And, because only you two know what you're saying. What's your view on this? So thank you very much. David, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, it's not a great pleasure to follow David because he always gives such a good talk. Uh, and I do have to say that I'm really very impressed by the reliability that they've achieved with that system. It's such a, an inventive and an innovative system. And to have the reliability levels that they've got you know, so early in the piece, I think is a fantastic achievement. And that's reality, that's not just thinking about it. And it's always harder to do things than it is to talk about them. So I've got the easy job tonight, so I'm just going to talk about it. Uh, and I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about the auto industry's view of the future and, and what we might think intelligent mobility might mean for the future. So I'm standing here on behalf of the Automotive Council, which is the collection of automotive industry players in the UK uh, who uh, employ people here and hope to have a future here in the UK. And they meet periodically to compare notes and try and make sure that there is a future for the automotive industry in the UK. That's the purpose of the council. And the council has a number of different areas where it has interests because it thinks there's something important going to happen in future. And intelligent mobility is one of them. So without trying to represent anybody's particular views within the automotive industry, I'd just like to give you uh, an overview of, of what the industry is thinking at the moment. And, and first, and this might surprise you, uh, it is not that the car is the only means of transport. Um, the industry is wide enough awake to see that things are changing, uh, that this is a very crowded island with a very high demand on mobility, uh, and that we are reaching the limits of capacity uh, and therefore we have to think about all sorts of different modes of transport if we're going to meet, move people and goods efficiently in future and indeed we already rely on lots of different modes of transport in order to make our economy work and if those modes begin to stop working, if things begin to seize up then our economy stops very very quickly so as soon as there's a tanker driver's strike then within a day or two there's no bread in Sainsbury's and, and that's how tightly coupled the system is. So we have to think about all of these things working together as a great big system. Another thing that's at the front of the industry's mind is this, which is that the projections for the UK are that the population is going to increase. That makes the UK rather unusual in terms of a developed nation. Most of the developing nations the population is stable or even declining, but in the UK it isn't. And the projection by 2030 is that the UK will be the most populous country in the whole of Europe, including Germany. 
So that's quite an interesting thought because I said a few moments ago, this is a pretty crowded island and we have lots of demand on our transport and we're pretty close to the capacity limits. So if you look at where we are now and where we're headed, that just says things are going to get more difficult. And if you do the calculations for how much demand there might be on road, because of course the auto industry is primarily interested in road transport, even though it acknowledges other forms of transport, then we can easily project nationally that there would be a 25% or maybe more increase in the demand for road-based transport um, by the time we get to about 2030, which is not really very far away. And that says that we've got to build more roads because the ones we've got at the moment are all clogged up. But actually, to build 25% more roads inside 15 years, I, it doesn't take a genius to work out that's not going to happen. So, we've got an interesting proposition here. It is either all going to jam up because we can't build more roads, or we've got to think of a more intelligent way of using the infrastructure that we've already got. And I'll talk about roads from now on exclusively, but similar thoughts apply to rail and airspace and even canals and, and, and seas and waterways. We have to use what we've got more eff effectively. And so we need to stop thinking about having fixed systems with fixed capacities and start thinking about how we put flexible systems onto those fixed systems and get increased capacity because we use the fixed systems more effectively. If you calculate the total number of road miles that are available in the UK, then there's about 300 yards for every vehicle in the whole country if they were all on the road at the same time. So there's loads of tarmac in this country. The issue is to use it more effectively. So, these are the industry's th thoughts. I'll just press the wrong button. These are the industry's... Oh, dear. Down arrow, probably. Yeah. <laughs> So, having given thoughts to that, the industry coined the phrase intelligent mobility and gave it a definition. And this is the definition that they gave to intelligent mobility, which is to increase mobility, to improve safety, and to enhance user benefits, while simultaneously reducing pollution, reducing consumption, and reducing congestion. Three up, three down. Now, you can do some of those some of the time, but if you can do all of those simultaneously, that fits our definition of intelligent mobility. And it's quite a challenge. Could we really do that? Could we put all the good things up and bring all the bad things down simultaneously? And you could do a little test. We don't say what technology needs to be around in order to enable this. This is simply the outcome. So it can be applied common sense would be the route to intelligent mobility. And, and, and you know, if, if that's the case, that's brilliant. So you can test this. Would building more roads suit that definition? Answer, no, it wouldn't, because it might increase mobility, might get more movements, but it wouldn't improve safety because you just scale up the same number of road deaths per passenger kilometre, and it certainly wouldn't reduce pollution consumption, and it may or may not reduce congestion, reduce congestion. So you can test your solutions against this to see whether they might or might not fit the definition. But this is the goal that the auto industry would like to research and then pursue. And because you have to produce roadmaps for all these things these days, the, uh, the working group which I, I chair, and which is why I'm standing here, uh, has produced the statutory roadmap. And I don't really want to talk about all this tonight because it's far too complicated in terms of the detail you put on up on the map. Suffice to say, a lot of thought has gone into what it is that we might have to do over the next 20 years to be able to deliver systems that really would give us that sort of intelligent mobility which we seek. And the good news is that technologically, there's probably no reason why it can't be done. The bad news, as David pointed out, is it'll take a time to get there. So if we had one part and one part of our map, as we do, right up the top, right over the right-hand side, autonomous vehicles, technologically, we'll be able to get there a lot more quickly than we can in sociological terms, because there are a whole load of issues to do with legal and social uh, and human behaviour issues, which will take a long time to solve, regulation being one of them. So that may be 10, 15, 20 years away. So this is long-range thinking that I'm sharing with you tonight. 
And I'd just like, very briefly, because we've only got 20 minutes, um, and I could speak for about five hours on this subject, so it's very difficult preparing this in a short space of time, or to, to try and fit it in a short, short space of time. I'd like to sp speak for a few moments about automation, because everybody's very interested in that, autonomous vehicles and all that sort of stuff. Um, a little bit about connectivity, by which I mean the, uh, the handheld. Everybody now has a, a smartphone, or almost everybody has a smartphone and being connected is very important to us and is a key to intelligent mobility, we think. And then finally, human behaviour, which is probably the real issue. As everybody says, all these things would be very easy if it wasn't for people. So, a few words about autonomous vehicles, and everybody's seen this. This is the Google car. Um, actually, very interesting, this. The industry has very mixed feelings about Google, having done this, because Google really has upstaged the industry, which is an extraordinary achievement given how much money is in the global motor industry, and these guys really have upstaged the industry. It wasn't long ago that the industry said autonomous vehicles won't happen for 20 years or more, meaning it's not really on our agenda. Within a space of two or three years, they're now all saying that autonomous vehicles will be within five or 10 years, and they're all putting vehicles on the market which are demonstrators for autonomous technology. So it's very interesting how this disruptive interference from another place has changed the industry. I think it's very interesting sort of social uh, commentary there. But Google aren't the only people. Uh, and actually, fortunately, we've got some very good people here in the UK, and uh, there's a team at Oxford University which has got a vehicle which is different from the Google vehicle, and is a very capable vehicle, and you'll see it driving around the Oxfordshire roads occasionally, if you're lucky. Um, so there's a lot of technology going on, and it isn't only in other places. And there's some very good stuff going on here in the UK. And the real thing about this is that these days, that sort of technology can be retrofitted and embedded in fairly normal cars. And it's fairly unobtrusive. So this stuff that allows your car to drive around automatically sort of comprises a few cameras tucked up by your rear view mirror looking out the front windscreen, a few sensors on the front and rear bumpers, and, and so on and so on. Fairly unobtrusive stuff. And the technology is actually quite well developed these days and pretty comprehensive. And the big issue really is to get the price down to the point where it doesn't make the car cost a fortune and to get the reliability up to the point where everybody is comfortable allowing it to drive their car for them and of course putting all the regulatory and other stuff in place to make it happen. Well, if that's what's going on, if you will, on the outside of the car, what's going on on the inside of the car? And this is an interesting journey because it's been going on inside the car for a long, long time. What's now called infotainment started with entertainment and then grew into information and entertainment, hence infotainment. But we've had car radios for years and years and years. And that, of course, is a very important part of connectivity. You're connected to the outside world if you've got the radio on and you're listening to the news or whatever. And those systems have become much more sophisticated and now go all the way up to TV. TV which the passenger can see but the driver can't. And very sophisticated entertainment systems interlaced with information systems including SatNav. So those systems are very much focused at the people inside the car, whereas those first systems I was showing you are really looking outside the car. But the whole system on the car that which supports all of it is these days a very sophisticated computer with a lot of sensors running all around the car. So the computer and the network inside the car these days is extremely sophisticated, has millions of lines of code in it. And there are other things that we've sort of got used to that we don't really think of as being high technology. So lots of people now have things like cruise control. And some people even have par automatic parking, and there's lane change, and there's a collision avoidance. There's a whole series of systems these days that are coming thick and fast now, which we call driver assist. And so inside the car, we have inter infotainment in increasingly complex fashion, sophisticated uh, fashions. We have driver assists, which are becoming increasingly complex. And of course, we have the ability to do this now. So what do we call this? Because all of a sudden we've got this handheld device, this nomadic device, which actually isn't built into the car, but can communicate with the car and the car's computer, and can communicate with people outside. So now this thing can communicate outside the car and it can speak to things inside the car. It may even be able to give commands to things inside the car if we wish to allow it. And all that technology is just sort of there. 
So some of this stuff is becoming very close. Not quite sure what to call this, but, oh, I'm sorry, here's a button just next to the one I mean to press, and it takes me back to the key every time. Sorry, guys. Must be more careful. So there are big changes coming in the motor industry. Big changes, because another upstart that has really shaken the industry is this outfit, Tesla. They've produced an all-electric car when the industry for years has said it couldn't be done. And they're not a motor industry company. So here they are, another disruptive force coming from the outside, produced actually a fantastic car. This car outperforms the BMW, Mercedes and the Jag. This is a real top-level car that is simply a better car. It's cleaner, quieter, smoother, it's better. But there's more to it than that. It's not just from the outside or the CO2 or whatever it is. It is also the inside. Now, I don't know how big your screen is inside your car for the sat-nav, but I bet it isn't as big as that. Because this car is designed as a computer on wheels. This is essentially your iPad on wheels. And all the thinking in this car is about you sitting in the car and being connected. And everything on that screen is electronic. There are no switches in the car. Even the switches that you see there are just images. You touch them, it's a touch screen. And when you put the map on that screen, you can really see where you're going. And you don't have to worry about the fact that your screen is so small that the map disappears off the edge of it and you can't quite work out where the next turn is. The point I'm trying to make in showing you these pictures is there is so much compute power available now in our cars. There's so much storage we can put into the cars in terms of data storage. There's so much communications ability that you can imagine that you can do whatever you like. This car can do whatever you like in terms of computing and automatic control. The test now is to imagine, what do you want to do? And that transforms the game. Because we always used to think, well, we'd like to do this and we'd like to do that, but we can't because it would cost a fortune because you could never get a computer big enough or reliable enough. If you turn the question around now and just say, forget all that, assume you've got a computer that's big enough and reliable enough, what do you want to do? That's a very interesting change of question. So what do we want to do? So what about transport? And what about transport in our cities particularly? Because that's where it's going to bite first, this congestion, this clogging up that I spoke about earlier. So let's think for a bit about the transport, of, uh, transport in our cities. Because the car, car might be very clever, but actually it doesn't solve this problem, does it? It might have lots of cars on the road, but they're all going to clog up. Well, actually, it does partly solve this problem, because this problem occurs because things move unevenly. So as people come onto the roundabout and things stop, then people back up behind them. And at very busy times, you only have to have one or two stops, and then you get big queues building up, and everything builds on everything else, and before you know where you are, it's all jammed up. If the vehicles coming onto the roundabout at the very beginning of the sequence I just described didn't stop, if they moved on and off the roundabout much more smoothly because they could move much more closely, safely, then you wouldn't get the big queues building up in the first place. So actually, the autonomous vehicle can help with this sort of thing, but it's unlikely to remove it. The, the, the problem here is simply denseness. We've just got too many people wanting to move at the same time, and they're all in their cars, and it's all going to clog up. So the obvious answer to this is, get out the car. You know, we have to get people into bigger vehicles. And you can see what that set of pictures is telling you, is all those cars can be taken off the road and put into that one bus. And that is an obvious thing to do, and that's common sense. Uh, or is it? This is the Strand, 12 o'clock. Almost every vehicle you can see in that photograph, and I took this photograph so I know it's genuine, is a bus. Tell me how many people you can see on the top decks of those buses. These are empty buses straight down the Strand. If I wanted to carry that number of passengers, if I were to put them in cars, I'd take a lot less space on the road. So actually, maybe the answer isn't to get out of our cars and into buses. So this now gets a little bit confusing, doesn't it? And we think also about carbon. We're not only thinking about congestion, we're thinking about all sorts of things. So let's just think for a little about carbon. I just want to make a point here. So this Nissan Leaf, it's not zero carbon, it is electric, but the electricity comes from a dirty power station. So actually some carbon is produced in producing the electricity which then drives you along. And if we allow for that, then with four passengers in, this vehicle, electric vehicle, 
gives us 19 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer. That's with four passengers in. If I only have three passengers in it, then it's 25 grams per passenger kilometer. And if I have the average of 1.6 people in it, then it's 48 grams per passenger kilometer. So here's another important point, and that is load factor. All this stuff about congestion and about carbon, the key issue is load factor. It isn't big bus or small car, it's how many people are in that big bus or small car. And remember that figure I just said, 48 grams. Well, this is how buses and trains do in London. I pick London for a very particular reason, because it is a big international city. So it's a good place to do a bit of thinking about transport in cities. And this is how the carbon footprint for different modes of transport in London has declined since 2005-06 to now. And they've done a really good job. TfL is a top-notch outfit. They stand you know, measured by any outfits in the world. They're, they're, they're a world-class organisation. And they have done a very good job in bringing down the carbon footprint of their operations. But to give you the headline there, the buses, even today, are running around about 75 grams per passenger kilometre. And the underground is running at about 60 grams per passenger kilometre. Those are two world-class operations, and I just told you that the Nissan Leaf was 48 grams per passenger kilometre. That tells you something. Car is not all bad. So how do we do that? Well, the trick is a trick. All these numbers, you have to understand what it is that's being computed. I put four people in the Nissan Leaf, if I go backwards, and I get 40, uh, and I get 19 grams. I put 1.6 people in the Nissan Leaf, I get 48 grams. If I now look at the average for the London Transport, as I did a few minutes ago, I get these figures which are 60, 70, 80 grams. That's because the buses and the trains aren't full all the time. So when you average it, that's what you get. Now you do have to account for the fact that they're not full all the time. You cannot run a system that is packed full all the time. But if you could, then this is what you'd get. If we had a mass transit system and had a 120 person capacity and you had 120 passengers on it all the time, we'd be down at six grams. Now just stop for a moment. The average in the UK at the moment for all of our transport is about 120 grams. So six is out of sight. They're a fantastically good result and would certainly meet the 2050 carbon targets by a mile. And that is today's technology. I'm giving you these figures on today's technology. And if you didn't have 120 passengers wanting to move at a time, but you wanted to move about 50 passengers at a time, then the electric bus that's just been launched in Milton Keynes, if it was full of passengers, would give you seven grams. And our Nissan Leaf would give you 19 if it had four passengers in. And the point here is load factor. Whichever vehicle you're taking, you want it to be full. So the solution to our transport problems is not to have a one-size-fits-all solution, but is to have a number of different sizes and then try to make sure that the load is balanced so that they are always full. And of course, you want to come down to the point where the smallest vehicle in the fleet is as small as you can get, so it's nearly always full. So just tacked on the bottom there is a little two-seater pod, which gives you 10 grams for two passengers, and the emptiest it can be is one passenger, that's 50%, which would give you 20 grams. So it'd never be worse than 20 grams. So, here is a vertically integrated transport system with different modes, and the trick now is to balance them all. It has to be integrated, and you have to be able to have each one of these things used when it is full, and you don't want to have a 120, uh, 120 passenger road train with three passengers on it. You know, that is not good transport. Despite all that stuff, we still take the car. Everybody does everywhere. And everybody, therefore, talks about getting out the car. What does it take? What does it take to get us out of the car? Well, you can regulate people out of cars, uh, and you can tax them out of cars or price them out of cars. And that really is big brother. That's forcing people to do something. You could do it the other way, which is to entice people out of cars, offer them something better. That's an innovative thought, isn't it? So what is it that we look for in our cars? The reason why people take cars is because, for all sorts of reasons, being able to make your mind up when you want to go and then just going is great. So spontaneity is a big deal. 
You go from where you are to where you want to go, so it's pretty much end to end, gives you personal space, and it's pretty low cost, or everybody thinks it's low cost, because you generally only calculate the petrol it takes to go on the journey. You don't think about the capital cost of the car that you're amortizing. So these are the reasons why people take cars. So if we wanted to tempt people out of their cars, we would have to give them a system that delivered on all of those fronts and in a combined way that was better than the car. So this is the answer to that question I asked earlier. What is it that we want to do? What we want to do is provide people with public transport systems that do all of these things in a way that it's actually better to take the public transport system than it is to take a car. Don't ban cars, because actually cars are really quite good, as we've seen in terms of carbon and flexibility. Very good. What we'd like to do is have a system which accepts cars, but gives you something that is better and makes you want to use it more frequently. And this opens up lots of questions. So in a city like ours, maybe we would have a vertically integrated transport system which went from walking to the bike, to the pod, to the car, to an on-demand bus, to uh, a, a, a normal sort of bus, to a super bus, to a train. All of these things should be available in a modern city, but it should be a balanced system which is interconnected. And of course, in order to use it effectively, then we want to be able to understand where those vehicles are, how quickly we can get on one of them, how we can hop from one to the other, and how we can pay for it all. So all being strung together with our handheld and the banking and the settlement systems that sit behind the handheld gives us access to a vertically integrated public transport system, which is essentially a spontaneous system. We can start our first mile and end our last mile at whichever time we like and whichever place we like very attractive system, because what we're thinking about now is the difference between command systems, which are essentially Big Brother, 1984 thinking, we give you a tram, it goes down here, it costs 30 million pounds a mile, 10 miles of that, 300 million pounds, that's the only system we can afford to put in the city, if you don't use that you're not going to use anything, that's the Big Brother approach, versus the responsive approach, which is we have a city, it has people in it, we need to move people around, how are we going to move them in such a way that it suits them? And can we have a system that is so flexible that it will simply deliver within the constraints of the city the things that we want? Good question. And it's a little bit like this. It's appropriate perhaps to think about this because Traffic in Towns, a Buchanan report, was published 30 years ago, well actually 31 years ago now, and it led to this sort of thing. This is what I would call the command approach, or the big brother approach, which is we're going to have cars in our cities, so we better adapt our cities to the car. And we built these great big monstrosities which simply divided the neighbourhoods in our cities. And if you walk around them these days, they're universally unpleasant places. That was imposing a system, that was a command system imposed on our urban environment. Could we do better than that today? So if we really think outside the box, what could we do today if we go back and say, what is it that we'd like to do? What we'd like to do is provide mobility within our cities without decimating our cities. So whichever city it is, let's work with what we've got. Let's go with the flow. So now just exercise your imagination for the last couple of slides. I'm thinking quite a way in the future now. But if we wanted to confer much greater mobility on that area of London, which is quite a big area of London. It is very well served by heavy rail coming into the termini and by the underground system. So there are good public transport systems of a fixed type already there. But if I want to move on the surface freely anywhere around that uh, area, I can't at the moment because all the roads are clogged up. Peak travel time, these roads are all clogged up. But there's 9,000 miles of road in London and 7,000 of them are side roads. We generally don't use the side roads. So if we had a transport system that could flexibly use the side roads, then you could probably navigate from A to B any number of different ways at a given time and therefore not get clogged up on the Marylebone Road, which is what happens now. So imagine I arrive at King's Cross and I want to go to Piccadilly Circus. And I come down on the train and I have my handheld and as I come on the train into King's Cross I just say that I would like one of these autonomous pods. And there's a string of pods outside the station and I'm allocated to number 21. I go to number 21 and I jump in. You notice from that photograph there that we've pedestrianised King's Cross. Indeed, 
we've pedestrianised the whole zone that I just showed you in pink. So now that zone is open to pedestrians, to cyclists and to pods. This low speed system of autonomous transport or low speed autonomous transport system, LSAT, can now take us around and it can navigate to where we want to go. It knows that we want to go to Piccadilly Circus because we told it and it can go down this route. This is Marylebone Road and then down Regent Street to Piccadilly Circus. Or it could go this route, which of course is a different route. Or it could go that route. Or it could go thousands of different ways from A to B. And if it knows what the traffic conditions are and it knows where it's trying to go, it's not that difficult for it to compute which route it might take that should avoid any blockages. If it's a very small vehicle, then it can use small side streets. And if it's a very small vehicle, then it's a very low carbon footprint per passenger. And so we could jump in the pod and it would take us whichever route it wanted to, down through perhaps Oxford Circus and on to Piccadilly Circus, and drop us off exactly where we want to be and drive off and pick the next person up. And that is a formula which you could see might work for London, but you could also see that that formula could work for almost any city in the world. And the important thing here is we are building no infrastructure. We are just running on what already exists. If we have a beautiful city, we don't have to put a great big motorway through it in order to get this degree of mobility. We're simply adapting our mobility system to fit the infrastructure, whichever city that is. Well, that may be a long way in the future, and it may be wishful thinking by many people's book, but things have to start somewhere. So I think it's very exciting, actually, that the first steps down this path are quite likely going to happen here. Thank you. Before we began, I did ask the two gentlemen if either of them uh, were able to tell us anything about the... Uh, you all know, don't you, there's going to be some kit put into central Milton Keynes with these pods in on an experimental basis. But I've never heard anything about it. I don't know where it's going or when. John Bint's giving one of those knowing smiles he gives. Um, there is a gentleman here, where's he gone, who said he might... Uh, are you able to say something for us? Can we just hear a bit about the Milton Keynes investment to complete this cycle of learning? As such as you can tell us, because you did explain to me, you don't know the details of it. Can you say just a bit about it? Yeah, well, I'll just yeah. pick up that bit, then we'll have the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Neil Fulton, and uh, I'm Programme Director at the Transport Systems Catapult, which is based uh, here in Milton Keynes. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, and hopefully very briefly, the catapult was established uh, formally uh, in, I think, the end of October uh, last year, uh, located in the Pinnacle Building in, I think, December, and we are formally launching in the Pinnacle Building. Uh, we've got a kind of uh, mini launch festival um, over a few days in, in June. Um, just to provide a little bit of background as to this piece of work, um, I can't take any credit at all for the original principles. That comes really from a lot of the work that uh, John Miles, the previous presenter, has, has done, and, and a lot of work from other members of the Automotive Council in terms of pulling a lot of the ideas together. The Catapult, however, has taken on the role of a uh, demonstration trial uh, so working with a pod manufacturer and uh, to be announced very shortly and with Oxford University, the uh, mobile robotics group at Oxford University whose system that you saw, uh, or the system that is installed in the Nissan Leaf that you saw before. Um, and the trial is really uh, an effort to get uh, a, a, an understanding of the social, practical, and technological capabilities of a system put into a city, and clearly Milton Keynes fits that perfectly. And the council have been extremely supportive uh, in making this uh, a reality. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, ultimately designing and coming up with uh, a product that we can eventually get onto uh, the pavements um, of Milton Keynes, but that's exactly where we are at the moment. And this will take place over uh, a period of probably the best part of a couple of years. Sorry, I'm going to let you leave it just like that. So, pods, 
running on pavements on a length of city centre. That's yet, right. Not yep. yet determined. That's right. Um, at a time scale, you know, when might this happen? Well, I think the first piece of work is going to be making sure that the product works. Fundamentally, the, the, the biggest issue that we've been working on throughout the program is safety. So there is absolutely no way that any product is going to get uh, onto the pavements if it is not safe to do so. And this original trial will always be manned by uh, a, a trained uh, driver. So um, yes, that's, that's the idea, is to get uh, probably three of these products uh, at some point, and I, and I don't know the exact timing, because it's really dependent upon the progress of the, uh, of the work that we're doing in terms of developing and, and establishing the, the product itself. But I would guess over the next two, two and a half years, something like that, we will have something available and usable. And we can't take away tonight in our minds an image like this or an image like those Heathrow and Woodlice or anything like that. It all depends on decisions yet to be made. Yeah? Decisions with regards about to what? The kit, about the vehicles. What they look like what or what they look like? Yeah, the, that, that isn't decided yet. Okay, I'm very glad. It's a terrific Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sure you'll get asked some questions. We, we have a discussion, and um, there's bound to be as many questions as there are discussion points. Um, and it's this fabulous mixture of this childish enthusiasm for um, space age toys and this ghastly beat of your common sense in the background. Uh, about realities and practicalities. Um, I've said it in other meetings and so forgive me, my personal nightmare is of this wonderful high-tech thing turning up and the door opens with a gentle s and inside is, you know, a half-eaten McDonald's and a pool of something rather unpleasant on the seat. Um, the difference between um, who we are and the kit that we have given to play with. Um, who will, Stuart is taking prerogative to start, uh, we'll start our discussion. Kick off with, with a question that's probably directed to both John and, 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 and David. Um, I found this absolutely fascinating. That even now I'm learning more and more. Um, but very, very perplexing. We've seen, even just in this presentation, a number of different vehicle types from, from Ultra and PRT to the to the, the, the way in which the, the motor vehicle will be reinvented, effectively reinvented, and then just as a, as a, as a, as a final temptation, the, 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 the pods that are shown in a, a CMK context. John introduced one phrase which I found quite attractive, which was a vertically integrated system, which was a mix of modes. Now that, that sounds good to me because it's bringing together all of these different, or has the potential of bringing together all these different different technologies, these new innovative technologies, and understanding the relationship between them and how they would work together. And that, that seems like, remarkably sensible, and it links it through to the use of the, the vehicle in a, the capacity in an efficient way, and the whole question of, of carbon efficiency. But my question to John is if you're looking at it, well, on both, is if you're looking at some form of defining a way forward in terms of policy and a strategy, is there a, mo a model available or can one devise a model that you can make this assessment and apply it to a place like Milton Keynes? possibly coming up with different scenarios that you look at those different vehicles and the different mix of vehicles to understand what the direction should be, rather than the rather ad hoc way that we seem to approach our transport strategy at this moment in the past and possibly in the future if we're not careful. That's a big question. Will you have a go? Does that make any sense? Very much question. Will you have a go at responding to this discussion? Yeah. I've caught John Binzai, he's caught mine. Who's going to come after that? I'll come to you. John Francis. How about Francis? I don't think there's a model with a capital M. Because the point that I was trying to make is that we're now moving into an era 
where we have very flexible, very <coughs> responsive, adaptive systems, if you like. So the fix is the infrastructure that you have. In our case, Milton Keynes. In London's case, London. That's the fix. That's the infrastructure. And you have a demand, which is the people moving around that infrastructure. But we now have technology that allows us to have a very adaptive system which will provide the mobility within that context, that fixed context. And so, no, I don't think there is a model that we can just copy here in Milton Keynes. Our use of the adaptive systems in Milton Keynes will be different from what they would be in other cities, but they're likely to be, in all cities, they're likely to be some layered system from small, which is walking, through to very big, which is mass transit trains or, or, or um, road trains or something like that. I also think that there are things that haven't yet been demonstrated which are on the verge of being transformative. I think one of our big mistakes is to get new technology and then just use it to carry on doing things that we already knew how to do but just a little bit better. The trick when you get the new technology is to do something you never did before. So to make a trivial example, dial ride Everybody's tried dial ride Nobody's ever made it work in economic terms. There is no commercial organisation that runs a dial ride service, because actually they have never washed their face. But it is conceivable now that you could have an on-demand bus service with the level of automation that we have with the computer control systems. The systems that taxi companies use are very highly refined and with a bit of adaptation could give you a shared ride like a dial ride maybe a taxi at the price of a bus. This is quite an exciting prospect because it would be an entirely adaptive system and there isn't, to my knowledge, any system that you can just point to and say that works, we'll have it here. It could work here and it might be in a city like ours that 90% of our transport is provided by an adaptive bus system or an on-demand bus system and only 10% is by these other things. Yet in another city it might be 90% by mass transit and 10% by pods or something for the last mile. So I think, I think the, the catchphrase, well, the catchphrase, the, the thinking here is we now have the ability to have adaptive systems, and that gives us an enormously different position. We don't have to change all of our infrastructure now to suit our needs. We can work with the infrastructure. I think that's the big difference. David, do you want to contribute to that before we go on to the next contribution? Well, this is a high-level question. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with a lot, a lot of what John said, and, and there isn't a model. I know the Transport Systems Catapult have got a, um, an ambition of building a, an integrated simulation or, or modelling capability for transport modes. Uh, I would say that, that where no one appears to start is with the user, and I could say that with certainty, having sat through a lot of transport systems catapult meetings and so on, and been told why are you thinking about the user. The important thing is to understand who's travelling and for what purpose, and, and what's being moved and for what purpose, and from where to where. Only then can you start thinking about an integrated mode of transport to meet those needs, and that's what we're not seeing at the moment. And I would say, you know, the biggest single transport investment in this country that I'm aware of at the moment is, is HS2, which happens to be, you know, an update of Victorian technology, thank you very much, and it still has a place. So let's not focus, it's very easy to get focused on a product. We shouldn't be focused on the product, we should be focused on what are we trying to achieve with a series of products, and there will always be better in the future, hopefully. So, so putting things on pause because there's something just around the corner is not helping us to get things in place, which is helping us to solve the problems that we have today and in the near future. Yes, now um, we're going to come to Councillor John Bates, who has recently been chairman of the Transport Committee here. Um, I'd like to ask him about the Transport Committee. Um, Councillor John, can you give us a press just for a moment longer? Uh, very few towns and cities here in the UK have got transport for London. There isn't anybody to do all this that you're describing. Um, we have an interest in the system of transport company here in Central Milton Keynes Integrated Transport Planning, ITP, and they're doing bus rapid transit systems in Lagos and Australia, all over the world, but that's because there they have an old fashioned public transport authority who can discuss this um, collection of modes, and, uh, Stuart, yes, and the progress of different. We don't do that anymore. And somebody said to me, as I passed to John, that that's our councils in ordinary towns, actually, are really not able to, they don't drive buses or taxis. All they do is give out a few licenses and dole out a few grants. 
And somebody said to me that the way technology is going, the best thing ordinary towns can do is nothing. Because this is sorting itself out. If you ask Raffles or you know the three uh, main taxi companies in the Kings, uh, thank you. If you just what you've said, if you go to their offices, which I thought would be smoke-filled, you know, bacon butty joints around the back of a train station like taxi driving uh, headquarters used to be, they're extremely sophisticated. And they were saying to me, look, mate, we know what's going on here, and we're working out our own investment plans. We know who wants to get where, demand like a demand responsive transit. Uh, you know, taxi, uh, but putting other people in it, uh, you put it much better than he did, about uh, a taxi at the price of a bus. The private sector is operating transit in this country and they will sort it out, it was said to me. I leave it hanging. Councillor John Bidd, what did you learn as Chair of Transport? It's, it's, it's fascinating to see the different directions that the different experts come to this. Looking up there, the fact that you've got one up in the top right that is running 700 grams a kilometre. Seven. 700 as that vehicle. Unless you find the other 99 people that want to go in it, oh, that, that thing was, that was absolutely yeah. that thing is running at 700 grams a kilometre, yeah. whereas the one below is running at 20 grams a kilometre. Oh, okay. Um, and, 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 and I think the interesting thing there is how many of us wish to take the same journey at 1.15pm tomorrow afternoon, will there be enough of us to all want to do the same thing? Because it seems to me, having lived in Milton Keynes 30 years, that actually people keep wanting to do different things from each other. And I think that this issue of sizing and loading is, is the vocabulary that I've picked up from today because I think the number of places where a big vehicle has a fighting chance of being filled is, well, maybe from the railway station up to the rows, and I can't think of a second one. Maybe, because we're struggling even with the electric vehicle to keep it full all day, whereas if you had pods, you'd have lots of them at busy times and you'd just park them up the rest of the time. So I think this loading thing is, where do we have lots of people all wanting to go the same place? And we have to think that through and work it out, because that's the only place where the big vehicle makes any sense. We've been working on a concept called the small vehicle solution in Milton Keynes for a while, and your vocabulary of a taxi for the price of a bus, a shared app-driven device, I think is, is, is hugely useful. And, and, and I like the, the academic kind of approach. We want the spontaneity, we want the end to end. Well, the vehicle that does that, and there's somebody in the radio in the vehicle already, well, that shouldn't be a shock to somebody who uses public transport. Um, and they just better go and get on a train to London, so that's going to have other people in the vehicle with them. So I think it is sellable that you have somebody in the cab already. The other thing you didn't say about the little vehicles is not only do they improve your carbon down to 20 grams worst case, and ideally 10, but also they treble your roundabout capacity and your road capacity because they're a third the size of another vehicle. So if you go back to all that thing about we've got 300 metres of road each in the nation, but we've managed to clag up Piccadilly Circus, I think the little vehicles improve our road capacity because you can get more of them on every 100 metres of road. And then I was thinking, actually, what do they do for our car parking capacity? Well, one way of saying it is they treble it, because you get three of them in every space. But another way of looking at it is they raise it infinitely, because you don't have to park the thing at all. It just wimbles off and takes somebody else where they wanted to go. So I think, I think kind, of, kind of fascinating, and for me, the, the bigger vehicles and the load factor and all the rest of it. Um, I think in our thinking we need to separate out the fuel source, which we all agree needs to become sustainable and electric, the guidance system and the routing and prioritisation system, because I don't think most of Milton Keynes will ever justify a system that needs to run on an installed route 
because there's too many miles of Milton Keynes. We have a wonderful low-density city that we all move towards. My final thought was, I wish you engineering experts could write down the problem statement for which each of these is the answer. Because if you could write that down, then us people to commission... a very dangerous challenge to give a consultant. I'd be writing down if you give me a fee. <laughs> then I suspect somebody should have done it and it should be in the literature, but I can't find it. Because if you could write down the problem solution that each of those solves, then when we have problem X, we will know to apply tool X to it, and at the moment you won't write it down. The only one I can think of is, when your problem is, you've got so many buses they're wearing out the tarmac, then the solution is a tram. Okay. It's, a, it's simplistic, but it's an attempt to create a problem statement to match a solution to. All of those interesting ones, useful, but when you write down the problem statement for Ultra at Heathrow, that would immediately demonstrate that Milton Keynes doesn't have that problem statement. So that in itself, I think, is a useful situation, other than, as I say, the one exception, we need to do something up from, 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 from the railway station up to the rest of it, and I think that's a special case, because there we have a showcase as well as a transport need. Lots of other ideas, and, and I'll sit down. Is that a question or a series of questions? No, it's a series of comments. Yes, I have a question. 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 Yes, I if you find me one, then I should be deeply impressed. <laughs> uh, the plan for Central Milk Keynes, which is the, uh, the business neighbourhood plan, uh, the, the group went to conclude that it was the loop that was wanted around the summer going up and down the altitude boulevard so that, that could every business and every resident. That was meant to be the end area. point, not the journey uh, itself. But I take so the your pods whizzing around experimentally up and down the silvery and apery rather than up and down the spine. That'd be more interesting. That was a statement. So, okay, the statement I see, and then Hank. Thank you. Oh, I, know, I promised Alan. Yeah, I did promise yeah. Alan. Yeah. I did promise Alan. Francis. Then it will be today, well, then it will be, and so I have some bad reason. And Theo, and then it's Rebecca. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll put on this North of Town Flatter. I'm not there, I'll never have been in Town Flatter. <laughs> I've been in Milton Keynes for 35 years, so. Quite used to this place. Um, maybe it's at the beginning, and he was absolutely right, that Milton Keynes was not designed solely for the car. I didn't play that. Um, and he's right. But that design was undermined as it was built because the grid roads were designed to be 30 or 40 miles an hour speed limit with traffic lights where they horizontally were vertical on the effect, not the 70 miles an hour and the roundabout as it was built. So some of that original design was on the mind by the people actually built it. But um, I really do have some questions. <laughs> I mean, I'm all in favour of, um, I mean, one of the things in the past, I have been the National Transport Speed of the Green Party. So I'm very much in favour of in the low carbon modes of transport. Um, and now, David Mowen, you said, um, does it make the private car, does PRT make the private car obsolete? And I just wanted the question, does it make the bus obsolete? Or do we need PRT and bus to work along, uh, alongside each other? And um, to, to John Miles, um, talk basically about the carrot and the stick approach, basically, the low chip. And I absolutely agree, I think that you, know, you need both. I don't think the stick is off in its own, I don't think the carrot is up in its own. So I think you've got to have the two to make it work. But when you said, um, why do people use the car? And we sort of put some human factors there. A couple of points that we missed was um, sort of snobbishness. You know, the old Margaret Thatcher figure, anyone over 30 on a bus is a fake. And the sort of showing off aspect, you know, that my cars are bigger and shinier than whatever the norm is, sort of thing. How can we sort of address those? I know it's, it's a sort of technological issue, but there's human factors in there as well. Have you got any thoughts? So if I can stop, uh, I don't think I said it got rid of the car, I said it helps people get out, out of the car. So it's about an integrated transport system and it's about first and last mile that enables people to then get onto uh, public transport. And that's 
has been proven around the world that if you can solve that first that total connectivity, that absolutely does work. If it's as easy or nearly as easy and it's cheaper or as cheap uh, and it doesn't inconvenience you, then, then I certainly would, would get out of my car. I always use the car because I can't get to where I want to otherwise, or I'm doing a trip where it would take me an inordinate amount of time. So, I think the point I was trying to make is first and last mile connectivity enables people to use the other good connections that are in place, be it the trains and all, all of the rest. PRT is, you know, the compromise, it's here and now and actually works today and it's proven to do so and it's a, a, a designed as a, a capacity of four uh, so that it interfaces with, with the car and with the family group and, and to, to, to um, play to John's uh, uh, load carrier. Uh, Sizing. So uh, Heathrow is an example, we interface directly with the car. Uh, unfortunately, being a business car park, our, our ride share is 1.4, it has been over the three year period that we've done. So ride share is important, more people can get together, but people want to, to, want to travel with their small groups, so it's a good size for that. But it's also important for me uh, that it's inclusive, that you have a vehicle where you can get a wheelchair in, where the, the, the firm can use it as well as the able bodied and to be blunt, the, the shorter journeys, I thought we were trying to get people out of vehicles all together for, for cycling and, and walking to, to get us more active. So it's not going to replace the bus. It's not, it's not a mass transit system as such. It's a distributive transport system. Uh, in terms of max capacity down a single guideway, so a single guideway uh, with the vehicles in it, we can do a four second headway. So we can do the equivalent of a 50 seater bus every 72 seconds. But we're not designed to do that, that would be an abuse of it. The idea is it's a distributive system, it's vehicles that only operate when they need to operate. So in quiet times they just sit where they are, they pick up a charge and, or, or just sit there quietly. When they're needed then uh, they're using, you know, hopefully the minimal amount of carbon to, to take people on their, on their journey. Do you want to respond to Alan? Yes, actually, I can't remember all of the questions, but one of the questions, I think, uh, was, was to do with carrots and sticks. So if I may just start with that one, and if there was something else that you really wanted me to answer, perhaps you'd remind me afterwards. But the carrot and stick one particularly um, stuck with me because you said, you know, we probably need a bit of both. Um, and and in, in the real world, you usually end up needing a bit of both, something in the middle. But I do incline more towards the carrot end of the spectrum, I must say, because I think when you come to people making choices. The human behaviour thing is very important and it's very complex. And I'm old enough to remember when colour televisions came in. And I can remember very clearly when colour televisions came in that they were two and three times more expensive than a black and white telly. And there was a general opinion at that time that it would be a long time before everybody had a colour telly. And within two years, everybody had a colour telly and they were far more expensive than black and white, but people bought them because they wanted them. If you had tried to legislate that they had to have a colour telly, you'd have had a riot. But people just wanted them, and you get a huge tipping effect if you can put a choice in front of people where the choice is something they want to do. You don't have to beat them up. Why, why do we have to beat people up? It's, it's a very simple formula. If you provide something people want, then they will use it. And that has to be our goal. And that, if I may, John, is our exam question. You know, what is it that we want to do? Now let's try and design something that responds to what we want to do. And if we can produce something which is better than the car, then people will start getting out of their cars. People will start using this public transport system that never used to use it before. Because there is a downside. If I want to take the car up to city centre, I might drive in my big flash car and I might feel good about it and all that sort of stuff. But if it's Saturday afternoon, I can't park it. It is a real pain. It actually, it would be easier if somebody picked me up on a vehicle and gave me a cup of coffee and I could hook onto the internet and would drop me off at John Lewis. I would actually pay more for that than I would for the petrol in the car because there are downsides. So it, it's a question of providing something that is better than the thing you're trying to avoid. And if you can do that, then you've got a great system, seems to me. And you don't have to preclude anything. So no, it isn't about getting rid of the bus or about getting rid of the bike. And it certainly isn't about getting rid of the car. It's simply about providing an available transport system in the city which does what you want. Okay, I've got David Staple is next, and then you can. Yeah, but, uh, the I may ramble slightly, but I'm, I don't ramble too much, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I and others have been trying to persuade the council for a number of years to look into PRT, which I think is an excellent system. 
I am now coming round to the, to the view that actually a smaller vehicle, a more flexible vehicle, is probably a better answer simply because of the infrastructure costs. What we have in the Kings at the moment is a unique infrastructure of roads and roadways and roads through housing estates, which can be a flexible system. So I, I'm looking at that. I think the PRT system does work, would work in the Kings but it would not be as flexible as redesigning the car. Now, one of the problems that I have from listening to what John said, I don't know who your audience is for this. Because one of the... Well, no, well, you not. No, <laughs> no, but that, I don't think we are the audience. Because one of the things on your graph showed that the, the, the population of this country was going up to something like 70 odd million uh, by 2030, I think, whatever it was. A lot of those people are getting older. A lot of those people in Milton Keynes, the population of Milton Keynes is getting older. It's not, um, um, in terms of other cities, that many people, but it's getting, it is getting older. The population increase is, 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 is year on year, older, older people. One of the problems with the video that you, 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 you've shown there, now, I remember in the 1970s, the BMW Isetta, brilliant vehicle, two people, Small, smaller than that, probably, and it had a very small petrol engine. I don't know what the carbon footprint was, but it was probably fairly less. Um, and I remember going to Bangkok in 1985. Tuk-tuks. The first time I'd ever seen a tuk-tuk. What a brilliant mm. thing. You, you have an on-demand vehicle, you must get into, you say to the guide where you want to go, and off you go. Okay, there's a bit of gridlock, but that is a system that's been around since 1984. And where the hell are we with tuk-tuks? Why don't we have tuk-tuks here? Or even a bit fine version of tuk-tuks. Getting back to the point of my question, I think that you need to tell us, and particularly people like me, I'm 78, and I would like to use these vehicles, but I know there are a lot of people who say, you wouldn't get with me with one of those because it's not safe. I can't get my shopping in. I can't get a drug. I can't, can't take my grandchildren. I know I'm frightened to death that somebody's been sick in it before I got there. You, you have a, you and have there's a, a half eaten McDonald's. Yeah, and that's you have a credibility problem with a large number of people who are actually probably the target audience for this. Yes. Because if you're living on a housing estate somewhere in London Keys and you want to get to the city centre and you're too old to drive or you don't want to drive in heavy traffic and you want to go shopping and you want to take your grandchildren, this thing has got to answer those problems. And I haven't heard anything from you. I guess this is, this is you mentioned getting to the, the King's Cross and going to some, you're talking about business people. The majority of people that you, the target audience, are not business people. Okay. They're ordinary people. Right, right, right. What's the demographic of this? Yeah, what is the demographic? When you say this thing, what are you pointing at? Because, yeah. I, because, this, because this slide, the, the right. slide shows the system. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, the system, but yeah. Yes, but I suspect... I only put the pod up as an example yeah, but the teaser. Is... I'm not recommending that the pod is the universal answer to all transport. No, I'm not suggesting it is, but it is one of the answers that beats all the, all the things about flexibility, door to door, da 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 and, and Because some of, the, some of the areas that you're talking about... So with this? Yes, possibly. Possibly. If you can get over the humps and you could get... Perhaps we should draw a day. So we can move on. Is there a demographic or when you ask that sort of question? Is there a demographic in your mind when you make those presentations on that? Ultra PRT is designed for, for anyone to use. It's uh, EDA compliant vehicles. You, as I said before, you can get wheelchairs in there. You can get children in there. Uh, it's it's designed to, for for a family group to to well, travel. The other way around, you've got no customer feedback that shows a particular demographics are anxious about it. Okay. Well, we, unfortunately, we we've got a very certain demographic of, of where we actually uh, run the system at the moment, or where it, where it, where the trial system is, which is business travellers. Strangely, though, those business travellers who went there last week, uh, the car park was full and it was full earlier, and that's during the Easter holidays. So they're all bringing their families and their children, and their wives, uh, and and their relatives. Uh, because they like the system and they want their families to experience it as well. We're going to have to leave it hanging, Dave. You make a very important point about that. I've got Hank next, and for your reference, I've got Theo and then Rebecca. So I'm looking for fresh faces after that. So Hank is going to be next. Hello, Hank. 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 Hello,
first of all, I'll pick up on where David left off. Um, one of the things that I feel that we're missing out on is actually going to places like the third world to actually learn from their systems. Um, having lived in Africa and most of sub Saharan Africa, the first thing is Tuk Tuk's um, mini buses, it's even smaller than that. Um, introducing the system of teaching people to wait a little bit for these to fill up um, has been proven in large cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town that a 12 seater like that would take an average of 12 minutes to fill up, which is almost the same time as what you would wait for a poor taxi to actually arrive, rather than picking up a black hat. So, learning from other systems, I think we're missing a trick, and we definitely need to go to those, some of those systems India. Um, Turkey, etc. The second point I want to make is the fact that I'm absolutely disgusted and disappointed with the motor industry. The first thing to say is go back to movies like Sleeper, uh, Logan's Run, Blade Runner. These sort of pods were in those movies years and years ago. It's like everything else. The movies got it right the first time. Now, the technology, the fact that the industry is sitting on technology and not actually using it to the benefit of the people is actually what makes me disgusted. In the military, we have command and control, which is um, electronic signatures in vehicles to know exactly where they are, when they are there, so that they don't interfere with each other or accidentally kill each other, etc. Those things can be installed in vehicles to monitor where they are. Yes, I know there's potential for abuse and personal um, you know, uh, issues and data protection and all that kind of nonsense. But if you actually install that sort of system into vehicles and know where they are at all times, you bring in road safety, etc., etc. Command and control system working on technology. The last thing I wanted to say is Norfolk East is a unique system and that we have the ability to introduce all these things. And again, it will be down to command and control system, but also, um, going back to what the gentleman for back said, it is convincing people of the benefits and getting them to use the most efficient system at the specific time of day. I think a lot of people have mentioned that not everybody wants to go to the same place at the same time, but you'll demand your, your profile of users and making that, um, I think what John said, that problem statement. That problem statement can be made. It doesn't need to be made by consultants or engineers. I think that you know, it has the skills and capability, and some people off the street might actually be able to do it, um, is to know when your biggest population or group wants to use a certain or specific kind of transport. I would usually go, you know, younger people, maybe more senior citizens, etc. You can actually get that demographic right. And again, I think that we're missing a trick somewhere along the line of those. He's, uh, we must keep moving, but if you do well set yourself up for the accusation of a sluggard of the industry, because you remember you showed two what you call exterior forces or something, which normally in the old days used to be wars that would suddenly make technology leap forward, but there are those two outside interventions of which Google was one. Um, uh, and so your industry has been charged being a bit sluggard, uh, but uh, it does seem, I think, you want to give us the impression that that's you are now looking forward to moving on. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think some of this stuff is actually quite visionary, and uh, yeah, of course, you know, film people, you know, they are imaginative people, so I'm not claiming these are necessarily original ideas, you just need good ideas, and if you can make good ideas happen, that's what it's about. When was the first Tesla car made, by the way? When was the first Tesla made? Must be about six, seven years ago. No, the first, no, it's longer than that. 25 years, 28 years ago, was the first time that the Tesla motor or Tesla system was developed. Both the industries kept it again. Okay, you made your point. Right. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep moving. May I? Yeah, Theo, please. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, Charles. Well, it was designed with the separation of motorised vehicles and pedestrians. And, and with this pod system, what we seem to be doing is forcing basically what is effectively a two-man electric wheelchair into the area where there are pedestrians. And, you know, whilst there is some sort of way that electric wheelchairs work with pedestrians, they don't work that well, from my opinion. And to have a double width one plowing along uh, where the pedestrians are, I think is a mistake. I think if we're going to have some sort of on-demand transport system, um, it should be on the roads because that's where 
motor vehicles were designed to go, and I think that's where they should be going. So that worries me enormously. And to, to think that this little pod thing, when it's introduced, is going to have a driver, it's a kind of insanity, really. Let's just scrap it now, shall we, and save ourselves the money. Until we've got, you know, until we've got... It isn't actually costing it. Well, until we've got taxis at the cost of the bus, which would be a robotically controlled taxi, which I think is a great idea. It doesn't have to be robotic. Well, you know, yeah, right, a system that is automated in some way, an automated taxi, I think that's a very good idea. I think we should have it. I mean, Hayden mentioned that movies got it all right in the first place. Well, my mind keeps going back to the first Total Recall film with Schwarzenegger, where he smashed up the driver of the Jolly Cab. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> and I think that would well possibly happen even with CCTV. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, like John Bint said, that uh, the, you know, the ultra PRT system, you know, a, a command system uh, on perhaps on his tracks, on his own tracks, would work going up from the station. And I agree, I've always wanted to think that we could have something like a tram or an ultra PRT or something on its own track going from the station, linking the shopping centre all the way to Cannon Park and the, the theatre district down to station. I think that is a very, very good thing. I think perhaps that should be in the central reservations of the, of the grid roads, maybe Midtown Boulevard, and through Midtown Place shopping centre. I think that's a great thing. And I'll, I'll be quick. Just one, one more point I wanted to make that uh, your map of central London completely pedestrianised, that's just insane. I mean, how would lorries deliver goods? You know, how would families that were bigger than, say, uh, two people, you know, a mother with five children getting one of these little electric pods? You can get your answers to those questions by only had 15 minutes. Well, okay, I'm just saying that I just don't think that would have worked out. We have to be I'm looking at the third world, both Hank and others have said, David Stavis, and him. I think they have got the solutions that just really, really work. Because of, if you like, desperation, you know, we haven't got any money, how do we do this? How does our city work? And I think those are where we should find the solutions, not, you know, mad, two men, electric wheelchairs with a driver. <coughs> yeah, that's what okay, so yeah, you did say you know, that you thought Capital would be on the best of pavements. Did you mean that? Is that yet to be decided, or just bring that particular point as well? Is it a decision already then? It is a decision already, yeah. I That's correct. They, they, they certainly want the road going vehicles. But just as a point of clarification, the, the drivers are all for these, this initial trial. So any future product would be driverless. But let's do it Well, at this, this stage is really about proving the technology, making sure that they're socially acceptable. And, um, and and practical and, and, and with the paramount the area of paramount importance at this stage while the technology is still really in development is safety hence the reason that we move to train to okay, well, that's it. yeah it's just it's not what yeah. um, uh, it's not what you were telling you from that segregated ultra PLT system right yeah, this, We've got a pavement, a shared user of a pavement. It's a sort of completely different kind of relationship. We already have bicycles on there. These are a social mobility scooter, isn't it? Really? And as big as a small tractor. It's not what you do. No, we have a safety case. We, we regulate it under railway and other guided systems. Yeah. We have a proven safety case. We've done all of that. There isn't a route to a safety case at the moment for autonomous vehicles in a public space. Now, I know that the Department for Transport are reviewing the, the, uh, the regulation this year and they said they'll come back in November this year with their thoughts on how they will go about regulation. That's as good as we've got at the moment. And our catapult project may feed that whole process. It's an experimentation towards with that in mind, you see. Rebecca, could I share a Sure, I was living in this country when Thatcher deregulated uh, public transport outside of London. But my understanding is that prior to that, local authorities actually run, ran the public transport, the buses, and the bus drivers were public employees. So, so, yeah. so, All right. Um, and when it was deregulated, you know, everything got deregulated, um, not just the, the operation of the service, but the, the, the network, if you like. 
where the buses would run were no longer in control of the local authority. And that, I think, it was a huge mistake, probably, because whilst I'm sure commercial companies can run buses far more efficiently, I would like to believe that you know, it's the public uh, authority, the local authority, that has a much better idea of where they want them to run. And so in some sense, you set the network saying you want this frequency on this route to only, and whatever commercial company wants to bid on that route, you can bid. Um, what I'm interested in is how much <coughs> these systems we're talking about are dependent on having the local authority back in charge of setting its network, and how much it can just sort of stick with the existing, regu it's a regulatory environment question, how much either of your systems are thinking depends on a change in the regulatory environment um, to maybe one where we're back to being in control of our network destiny, but it doesn't matter commercially who operates it. Oh, or you see what I'm saying? So. Yeah, if I can have a go at that. Um, the reason we're working in Brazil and India and Taiwan and places is because of the model that they have there for putting things like this in place. So if you've got a deregulated system and it's, been, it's about businesses making money, clearly they're going to put the system in the place where they can get the fair revenue that pays them enough to pay for the system and make a small profit and therefore you're not going to get them elsewhere unless there's a public sub subsidy. So there is public subsidy in certain places. So the model that they use in Brazil, for example, is the local authority work with a private concessionaire. A private concessionaire will put in a proposal for a system based on the requirement, which is the problem statement, the origin destination data. Uh, and they will work together and they will work out a, a, an OD matrix and how they're going to service that. And then the uh, co local council of mayor will underwrite that OD matrix. So their business model then works because they know how many people they're going to carry from where and to where, and therefore they know what their income is going to be. And if those people don't turn up, then, then it's underwritten by the local council. It's very similar in, in India as well. But essentially what they do there is uh, they let a contract to a concessionaire over a 35 year period, which then allows them to work out a business case and, 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 and therefore work out paying back for the infrastructure, the vehicles, the operations, the maintenance of it and all of the rest. We don't seem to have as much here, apart from the complete de deregulation. I've just come, we've just been speaking to another local authority which is looking a little bit about solving their, their problems and their future problems in an area of Outer London, strangely enough. And what they're doing is working with the local industry because it's, they have a certain number of big uh, global players within their area and, and poor connectivity, so similar uh, to an area like this. So what they're doing is talking with the local industry. It's the local industry, those local companies who've gone to the council and said this isn't good enough. So they're working together and and I suspect that a big chunk, if not all, of the investment for the system that goes in will be financed by uh, those local companies. So this is a shared, uh, sorry, from the public, and learning in public. The, so the model you described is it's like a shared risk. The private investor puts in the service, but it's guaranteed. So if the returns aren't there, the, the, is the numbers are agreed. So, so when, once they agree the numbers of, of ridership, then if if they can't make it pay, then that's that's the private investor's risk. But as but if the numbers dip below that that guaranteed oh, number, so the numbers then, are the yeah, yeah. Not, the, not the profitability. Can I just answer the question? Of course, you can answer the question, please. Because the system that I was talking about, this integrated approach actually doesn't require any centralisation. So <clears throat> when Hayden was speaking a few minutes ago, he talked about command and control. And we were talking earlier about carrot and stick. I'd like to say that this is all proposed around the carrot, not the stick. So this is about to serve and assist, not to command and control. And if you want a good thing to happen, then you've got to recognise that money is what makes most things happen. So the thinking here is if we want to have low carbon transport and if we want to get congestion down in our streets, then we've got to find a way of getting low carbon vehicles
vehicles which will move people effectively, reduce the number of vehicles on the road, but at a price that is cheaper than the current favourite, which is the car. So this system here starts by saying, what's the price we have to meet? And that system there starts by the same question. And if you can provide a system that is clean and is you know, less congestion prone at a price that is less than the current favourite, then you don't need any extension because the market will simply make it happen. Oh, that's the premise. There are lots of things that might get in the way of that, because it might be that if you provide, I'm very keen on this idea, this is not my idea, but this on-demand bus, and it might be a smaller bus than that, but this is a sort of 18-seater, but it might be a 10-seater, and it is exactly the model that you find in the third one. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's exactly that model. The reason why it hasn't worked historically in the UK is because nobody can make money out of it. So if you could transform it so you could make if then everybody would do it. And then we would stop having to subsidise fixed bus routes, mm. which actually are providing a fixed route at a fixed time of day, which is not really what people want. No, people want is something to come and pick them up and they want to move. No. If you could do that and somebody who's providing service could make money, then you don't need the council to put money. Yeah. So that's the fundamental thing. Sorry, can I supplementary? Well, so when is five to nine, nine. Rebecca, go Go on. Well, there's a discussion, but there must have to be a dialogue. What is it that needs to be done to make that happen? Well, because there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's a big risk of this because it might not work. Because you can only demonstrate that that will work if you've got a fleet of vehicles available that can turn up on demand. Yeah. But before you've launched the service, you don't know if people are going to use it. So somebody somewhere has probably got to put 50 of these vehicles on the road and run them for two shifts a day for six months to see how it works out. Well, I've done that some, and the answer is about three million quid. So we find somebody that put three million pounds on the table to give, give it a fair chance to demonstrate that it will run. Then after that, it will take care of itself if it works, and if it doesn't work, well, then you just have to stop. Hang on, can I come back on this? That's the bus company thinking about that. We already have three very well-known operators with apparently an infinite fleet available on demand. You just ring treble two, treble two. Okay, so so it's wow. it's the bus thinking that says actually we need to spend three million pounds and buy a set of special vehicles. You only need a very small number of specialist vehicles for your DDA passengers and the person who just bought a fridge. Most of the rest of us, most of the time, could get in the ordinary vehicle that just turns up. Yes, John, but I don't think you would. If a car turned up and had two people in it already, you probably wouldn't want to get in it and be the third person in a small car. But you might be the fourth or fifth person in a medium-sized bus. And therefore, we have actually done quite a lot of thinking about it. That's why that system is different from the taxi. And it's getting to nine o'clock. There's one more over here. Can I just do it? We'll do this one and then see how we go. But I think we're going to have to stop pretty soon now. A hand went up the green. I don't know if it's his or hers. It's yours, okay, please. And probably the points are from one of the keys. Uh, one or two people will be aware that there is a network within workplaces that's recently started. And uh, I think it's in, really interesting in terms of the, the mix we've got here, because uh, there isn't one silver bullet, that's very clear, um, that can answer all this. Um, I suppose I do want to sort of, sort of fly the flag that actually workplaces actually working together actually does hold some of the key here. Um, clearly, you can, there are limitations in terms of aggregating demand, but just a very simple example. A week on Monday in Tilbrook, a new service starts at lunchtime for the employers down there and there's people like Redbull and T-Systems and that's just because people have started talking together. And I think one of the aspects here, of the, of the, the interesting aspect here is, is how much individualism do we play out here? Do we just allow people to choose to the infinite degree individualism because there are trade-offs here? And certainly under the smart go, you know, it's about identifying well, where are some of the common demands because that, in some places, they are exist there. So I think, yeah, I think we've got to find the mix of op options. And Milton Keynes has its own chemistry that will make that kind of work. Um, but let's not forget about actually talking to each other. And there, may, there has to be some trade-offs. Uh, and actually finding ways actually we can group things together. So the example down in Tilbrook is the commercial bus operator is taking their own of this on a service at lunchtime time and the employers and staff down there. So there is access in that area as well. And we treat that as a statement. I'm glad you spoke. Smart going. I think we smart going. Be, be, be reading about that. Then let your nice young man. Would you ask the last question or make the last question?
thinking about the image that you showed about in London when you get off the King's Cross and you, you talk about public space, which is all to do with human behaviour and, and all throughout the presentation we're saying when human behaviour studies happen in the future. And we're talking very much from an engineering point of view, a science, scientific point of view. But in that image we see uh, the surfaces of the, the ground being all the same. And we don't think about how in Milton Keynes we have a separation between the road and the pavements. Um, and if you are going to think about human behaviour, how uh, shared space is really important in this. Uh, no, let's talk about shared space. I think if you, if you are making the decision that the PRT is going to be on the pavement, I think it's fundamentally a wrong decision and you will change your mind when you do do those human behavioural research studies because you'll see that you need the same texture of pavement throughout the streets and pavements to be able to understand that pedestrians need that movement and that the vehicles can only be on the pavements when there's a merging in, in road textures. Yeah, your, your, your point is a very fair one, but as Neil said, that, that is going to be one of the first things that's going to be explored. The small number of vehicles in the limited space, how do people react? Well, the definitive point's been made, apparently, but I mean, I think that that shouldn't be something that's been definitive at this point in time. I think that should be one of the last decisions to be made in, in the process of understanding how human behaviour works in, in terms of where these positions. Certainly human behaviour is recognised as being a really big deal here, yeah. much more than the technology. We, we are going to have to start jumping to the nine o'clock and our guests um, and family come along on Monday Thursday evening uh, just before a bank holiday to make this contribution. Can I just say something before we finish? Well, <laughs> which is, which is, I, 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 I want to say this because there's been a, you know, some really good conversations, some really good conversations. There has been some implied criticism of, of, of the local authority. Yeah. And actually, I, as, as an outsider, as, as somebody coming from industry, you've got a fabulous council here. They are so forward-looking and so keen to do the right thing in the city. People come from China to look at buildings. And you've got a really go-ahead council here who are open to doing all sorts of things that, frankly, don't meet in many other cities. So I'd just like to say, you know, what a breath of fresh air, you know, those guys are, even if you can't do so much later. Yeah, it's obviously the prices you've heard, I think, about the all to do with a lament, in some cases, about the disempowerment of the local government, you know, the, the weakening of the town hall, uh, making transport planning so much good, right? That was, the, I think, the tone of the contribution. Uh, we really should stop, and so I'm picking this piece of paper up, this is a nice slide, to see if it tells us where the next one is. As I thank our guests, Hank, would you be ready to tell us about the next event? But, and I thank you, John and David, seriously, for coming out in the evening. I know it's an effort.